All right, welcome to another installment of Barbershop Talk brought to you by Red Stag Barbershop. Uh, Ted Emmett here with the athlete Kevin Strybosch and Ryan Lund. And uh, sitting in, with us in Red Stag tonight is actually one of my favorite people uh, in the whole world, Pete Vandermeer, one of, uh, what, 17, 18 Vandermeer brothers, something like that. No, one of six Vandermeer brothers, a 15-year professional hockey player and just all-around nice guy off the ice. Uh, Pete, thanks for being here. Oh, my pleasure, Ted. Thanks for having me. It's it's great to be here and happy to chat with you guys today. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty cool you decided to get your hair cut off today for this <laughs> for this interview, Pete. I'm committed. Committed. <laughs> well, hey, the, the Red Stag's the place though, because I think they do the, the hot shaves, they do the head shaves. I think after when we're done, actually, everyone's gone home, but Lund is gonna give you a uh, a head shave. So Yeah, sure. I'm up for it. <laughs> What's what's the worst that could happen, eh? Yeah, no doubt. I've seen some of your employee moves here. I better better slink out the back door quick. Yeah, I know. Okay, well, we'll get you eventually. Well, I guess, yeah, just kind of give us the, the coal notes. Like I said, you know, the Vandermeer family, there's there's six of you. I will see if Lund or Kevin can can name all of them. We'll see if you can name all of all of your brothers, I guess. But, yeah, give us the Coles notes, I guess, just, uh, I, you know, your life story. Obviously, growing up here in Red Deer, playing uh, junior hockey here, and then going off and playing in a, for one or two teams professionally. Yeah, yeah, 20, I think, is the number. But, yeah, we uh, we're uh, we grew up in Caroline. We're all born here in, in Red Deer at the hospital because that's where you go to get born around here, I guess. And, uh, yeah, grew up uh, in Caroline there, uh, all six of us there. Pete, Joe, Dan, Jim, Bill, Ted. There we go. Got it all. There's even a Ted there, Ted. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, played minor hockey in Caroline, Rocky Mountain House, Sylvan Lake, uh, played midget AAA in Red Deer. I uh, was lucky enough to to slide into the Rebels there the first year that they were in operation and had, uh, you know, an amazing time here when the when the Centrium was brand new and the team was new and, and had a great time growing up here in Red Deer. And then, uh, yeah, off to parts unknown <laughs> all over the place. Uh, uh Played in the International League, the East Coast League, the American Hockey League, and a little bit in the NHL. But, yeah, kind of all over the map and then wound up uh, finishing off, uh, yeah, 15 years playing pro and chasing a dream and played a little bit for Wayne and Phoenix and had a good time along the way. You're not done playing though, are you, Pete? <laughs> no, I'm not 50 yet. One more year. <laughs> played for uh, come back. The guys uh, convinced me there, Mike Dempster and Patchett and Johnny Lee and the boys convinced me to come out and uh, – after I'd retired from playing senior hockey for 10 years already in Bentley and Innisfail, finally thought I had her packed in, but the guys convinced me at the golf course to come and played the last two years for the wrestlers here in Red Deer uh, out of Penhold. And that's been, that's been a blast uh, playing with guys that are old enough to be my almost grandkids and get told how slow and old and ugly and dumb I am, but yeah, still having fun doing her. That says a lot too, just about your your love for the game, right? To go in and play senior double A, and like you said, you know, I think, you know, at at your age too, out there playing, I not to to throw any daggers at you, but I assume probably the oldest guy in the league, which is I think is a compliment because like I'm about ten years younger than you, and I got to take a break after tying my shoes. So well, I do too. It's a long ways <laughs> down to the skates, but. It's fun. Well, I've got uh, four kids at home, so I need to get out of the house once in a while. And <laughs> it's fun to fun to go out and you know, love playing hockey, love being around the guys, and and uh, part of it too really is my kids are all too young to see me play professionally, and not that it's uh, it's great spectacle to see me out there now, but at least they they can see that I could still kind of get around or have an idea about that stuff. So uh, it, it's fun. I love it. So you've been you've been in hockey for for over 40 years over <laughs> over 44 just years there. Just <laughs> there, yeah. and uh obviously you've seen it seen it change over the years so back when you played to the rebels for the rebels compared to the rebels nowadays what do you think the biggest the biggest change is is it is it the nutrition the 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 workouts the the technology like is it is there one thing that really stands out for you the the biggest change from when you played uh, junior hockey uh it's so so different to answer your question yes all of that like we we you know it was very really just starting to get into the nutrition and uh you know sports psychology and that sort of stuff was just kind of beginning when i was starting to play junior but it, it's a totally different game like after the lockout in 04 everything totally changed the game changed like we used to play with a red line i was trying to explain to my kids the other day what a two-line pass was like, what are you talking about uh that and just you know how, how physical the game used to be you know it, it's faster for sure now and it's more skilled but it, it was 
definitely way more physical and just the mentality was was a lot more right. violent than than it is now and and more on uh, the focus more on wearing teams down and and trying to intimidate teams and push their good players out of the games where where now it's it's to it's to outskill them and outplay them and you know somewhere <laughs> in between that is is perfect but i don't right. think it'll be perfect uh have you done any coaching or thought about getting into coaching or is it do you find it's maybe a little too different now that you might not be able to that it would drive you crazy trying to coach these kids throughout my career too. Like I was a player assistant coach in the East coast league and in the American league. And, and I always thought once I was done playing, I would just transition into coaching, but you know, life kind of sneaks up and you have little kids and come home. And I, I really didn't want to, okay. Part of the reason why I retired was while well, I was too old and slow and cranky in the first place, but I was, you know, you get sick and tired of traveling and being on the road all the time. Like being on the road's great, but you know, all the time. So when I came back, I figured, well, I'll just, I'll be here and, and be a dad and, and hang out and get, get my second life kind of started after hockey and, and did that and figured I might get back into coaching. But then I wound up coaching my kids. I coached my kids, uh, three of them for 10 years and did all that and ran practices and traveled all the place doing that and loved it. It was fantastic. Uh, after COVID, the, the three that were playing, they pulled a pin, they're all ball players and they kind of concentrated on that, which is awesome. And I love being part of that, but it's, it's kind of nice just sitting in the stands and drinking beer and eating spits and bitching about the <laughs> shitty coaching. It's, it's great to do that now. But uh, that, that's something that I've talked about uh, with my wife too, about maybe once we get these kids shipped out, then maybe it'll be, you know, there'll be an opportunity to get back in, whether it's junior or whether, uh, you know, getting back into the pro scene. But yeah, right now it's it's nice just not being gone all the time sort of deal, if that, if that makes any sense. So uh, for anyone that hasn't seen you play, how would you describe your 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 game? Would you be a uh, would you be a skilled guy, a uh, a fighter, a um, a playmaker, a scorer, a yep, all a pylon? <laughs> he, clear, he clearly hasn't seen your play. Yeah, <laughs> what a wrestler's game. Has your game changed now playing for the senior wrestlers compared to when you were playing pro? Oh, it had to. Otherwise, I'd be <laughs> I'd be in jail for sure. Like I. I started like when I was a minor hockey league player and even uh, at different points in junior, like I was a skilled guy. I was little, I was small, I grew late sort of deal. But um, when I got into major junior, like there's only room for a couple of guys on the bottom two lines. And the only way to stick around doing that was, you know, work harder than anybody else and finish all your checks and fight and scrap and bite and gouge and try to stay in the game a little bit longer for, for another day. And, and I did, did that till I got to the point where in, in red year that I got to be, you know, got to be a skilled guy again, but still contribute physically and whatnot. And then the great thing about hockey and the bad thing about it is once you get to the top of one ladder, you're at the bottom of another. So when, when I turned pro, there wasn't room for, you know, everybody's drafted, everybody's signed They're you know, they're skilled guys they're hundred point guys. And I wasn't one of those. So I had to start at the bottom and, and work my way back up so that I could get more time and power play time and score points and just kind of did that. And throughout my career, just tried to change and adapt to just to be able to stick around for another day in whatever league I was in and try to get to the next league. So just kind of did that forever. But for the most part, I was biting and kicking and scratching and, and, and hanging on for another day. And the enforcer life, that's a tough life, right? Uh, both Jerry, like while you're playing and after, and you talked about kind of your second life. And obviously, uh, you know, we see it at the golf course all the time. You're working here, you're back kind of in your, in your hometown, in your home area. But I know for a lot of guys too, right? When you retire from hockey, it's a, a, a little bit tougher go for a lot of guys. And I know now that's something, a cause too, that's close to your heart and started a golf tournament for that and everything. But I mean, how, I guess, did you transition from professional hockey to, I, I like basically leading a normal life. Yeah, it's a it's a different life for sure. Like that's why people want to play pro hockey. Like, you know, you're playing in front of thousands of people all the time, and people chanting your name or people booing the hell out of you because you <laughs> yeah. suck because you're on the road. But um, yeah, it was it was a fun, great life. But at the same time, too, a lot of guys have a have a hard time transitioning, whether they're skilled guys or whether they're they're scrappers like I was, right? You know, guys get lots of knocks to the head and and not just, you know, there's all those kind of problems with depression and CTE and all that sort of stuff, but just just physically, everybody, doesn't matter if you score 50 or you get 50 fights, like you break bones, you pull, you wreck your knees, you wreck your shoulders, everything's buggered. But um, when I came back, it, it was a pretty easy transition for me. I grew up on a sawmill out by Carolina and we, we worked hard to get what we needed to do. And, and 
I kind of fell ass backwards into some great opportunities here because of the things that I did when I played and was able to carve out a living, start a couple of businesses and I'm really enjoying life and not having to, don't get me wrong. I love beating the crap out of people, but it's kind of nice when you don't have to for a living every day. So no, it's, it's been a fun transition. And, and like you're, you're talking about a little bit, we, we started a golf tournament to, to help with some mental health initiatives and looking after some guys that, that do get in some trouble, whether it's, uh, you know, financial stuff or, or mental health problems or, or drug addiction. A lot of guys have a real hard time transitioning after hockey and yeah, boohoo, you're a, you're a professional athlete. Who cares? Like what's wrong with you? You got a good life and guys do have a good life, but it's, uh, heard it described as guys being institutionalized a lot too like a lot of pro athletes you're you're told when to eat when to sleep when to shit when to do everything right and once you get out of that you don't really know how to do things for yourself so it it, it takes a it takes a little bit for guys if they don't have a good support system around them family or, or or a gal or whatever to get their life going and and eventually guys do but sometimes everybody needs a little bit of help so that's what we're trying to do with their golf tournament and charity so what's the uh what's the name of the golf tournament when is it and uh, there's still spots available there are we we just started it last year and it took off great so it's it's uh pete vandermeer and friends backyard brawl enforcer appreciation golf tournament nice and short yeah. snappy, <laughs> it's snappy yeah. I, I wanted to be a little bit different like what the hell is that but try to throw everything into one kitchen pail and, and get it figured out and so you got guys who've been hitting the head repeatedly over their career and then they all have to say hey i'm here for the uh Oh, uh, the golf tournament. Yeah. Pete's tournament. Yeah. Well, th they're usually dumb as hell. So then they have to have somebody with them. So that's their support system. So away you go. So we're, we're just, it's building the ladder up so everybody can be looked after. And, and it's uh, September 5th. We, we got so many great guys returning from last year. Uh, it's out at the Springs where, where we kind of try to live most of the time if we can or not there. Everybody treats us great. Ted, you're great out there. All those other donkeys look after us really well and, and let us kind of do what we want. So it, it, it's going to be a blast again. I guess in that on that note too, because not only do you, you, know, you run the, the charity tournament, but uh, especially in my days at Hockey Alberta and when Kevin was there as well, you're at uh, base kind of every tournament. Like there's, it doesn't seem like there's a cause that you, you won't support, right? Which obviously when you're a player is something that's kind of part of the job. And I'm guessing for you, it's just kind of like a family value thing. And at this point, just kind of hardwired into you that you love supporting all those causes and golfing, obviously. Yeah. And they give us free beer and golf. So of course I'm there. Like what the hell? No, like we, right from when I was a, a kid, even before playing in Red Deer, you know, there's so many, you know, great charities and, and I was lucky enough to, to travel all over North America. There's no place like, like Alberta and especially central Alberta, how the people in all of these communities support whatever is in need. Like it's amazing the money that's raised, like whether it's stupid Oilers 50, 50, or like all the great charities around all the different, you know, hospital lotteries and every one of these uh, golf tournaments in the summer, it's amazing the money that's raised. Like I've been in New York and Boston and Philadelphia and they're happy if they get a 10th of what we raise in those and in, in our little small communities. It, it's, it's great. And so I've been doing these things since I was a teenager and I love coming back and love getting a day on the golf course and getting to see everybody and meet everybody that supported me and all my brothers throughout our career and our struggles. It's great to be able to try and give a little bit back and, and just get to see everybody. It's a social deal and who doesn't like golfing and drinking beer with your <laughs> is friends? Is that the best part of being a former pro athlete, getting all the invites to, to the golf tournaments? It is. It's, it's a darn good plus, that's for sure. It's awesome. Okay, so if you need a professional <laughs> athlete at your golf tournament, Pete will come reluctantly and drink your beer and play golf. Yeah, there you go. So uh, with all the all the cities you played played at in your career, did you have a favorite or is that is that a loaded question? Well, I get, I've been asked that lots and uh, – there isn't one answer for sure. Like I played in some great cities all across the States and in Canada, but I was lucky enough. I played in Philadelphia with my brother, Jim for three years. And that was fantastic. Just playing with your brother professionally down South in that town. They loved how we played and we were idiots. We fit in just right down there. Did you guys, uh, uh, did you guys live together down there too? Yeah. Or? We yeah. lived together down there. It was, uh, it was entertaining. <laughs> and I, as I was lucky enough to play with two of my other brothers, Dan and Joe in Richmond, Virginia as well. And that a just beautiful city and, you know, great weather and skirts are short when it's, when it's <laughs> nice out all the time. Can't complain about that, <clears throat> but also got to play in San Antonio and Phoenix, Boston, Providence, like just played in so many really, really cool towns. And 
it, it was neat. The first half of my career, I played mostly in northeastern states, and you know it's neat all the history and everything like that. Big cities, which is was you know a big change from Carolina or Red Deer for sure. <laughs> but uh, that was that was incredible to play out there and played on some great teams with some great guys. But the second half of my career, I was predominantly in, in the southwestern states, and that was great. Just <laughs> weather and golf, and you know being able to fly everywhere too, whether we're in the American League or in the NHL, and. You know that that sort of stuff is great when you wake up and you're not freezing to death every morning in the in the middle of winter is was pretty nice and and now that I've gotten older I got a chance to you know go back to those places and and you know kind of rediscover them with with my wife Mandy and my kids uh, uh, two of my kids were born in the states well three of them were born in the states but two in in one was born in San Antonio one in Phoenix so there those places are always kind of special to my heart just because of that too. And now I was it in San Antonio? Were you there when Dustin went down yeah. for, for tryouts? So yeah. I'm guessing you remember that. Yeah. Right? What, what, what would he have been about? 20, 21? Yeah, they were like right out of the Rebels. They did were you, right out of junior. Now, yeah. I, I hope the answer is yes. I don't know. Like, did you guys did you guys fuck with him at all? I don't know how long <laughs> he was actually down there because I know he decided it it wasn't for him. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> him and my brother Ted actually came together out of junior from Red Deer from the Rebels and came down to camp and we had fun with them. It's easy because, like, I was quite a bit old. Like, I'm 10 years older, 12 years older than those guys. So, oh, yeah, I screwed with them a lot. So it was fun. <laughs> you know, all the stupid little things, the shaving cream and the gloves and baby powder and the skates, all that kind of stuff. But just, uh, you know, telling them they had to go fight guys when they really didn't have to. <laughs> That's always good. You're the reason he can't do math. <laughs> yeah. He couldn't do math before. Yeah. Yeah. So between you and your brothers, who who would be the best – the best trash talker oh geez well probably bill and ted because they they're the youngest day eh? so they got to hear <laughs> all the good ways to get under everybody's skin when when they're a lot younger and you know ripping guys the stuff we're telling guys professionally they're telling guys in minor hockey right? like, <laughs> like a lot of it went over guys heads but yeah they chirp quite a probably billy too because he can get quite annoying if he really wants to oh yeah I, I, yeah, yeah gets, especially on the gets, golf course yeah, he, gets, <laughs> he could back it up on the golf course he's a pretty good golfer but what would you say because you're the oldest of six brothers would would you say that's more like would you rather be the oldest the middle or the youngest like the oldest obviously you probably have to help take care of them and stuff but then you're also you're kind of the boss right and you don't have to put up with much shit well you got to tune them in once in a while but they're coyotes right yeah you gotta <laughs> you gotta shock and awe if they ever really try to gang up on you you're toast because there's so many of them so you really gotta <laughs> beat the absolute snot out of them but for sure the oldest because yeah you do have a lot more responsibilities for sure but then i just because that's who I was, I grew up, I wanted to take care of people. That's what I did with my teammates because it was just like a bunch of little brothers again, right? So I'd rather be the oldest and tell people what to do than be the youngest and get told what to do all the time. And in the middle, you're screwed. Either way, you're getting in shit from both ends of it. So so I'd for sure rather be the oldest. And I guess you get more new stuff when you're oldest, right? That's I'm guessing, right. Yeah, six, six brothers. Like, God bless your parents, six boys. And I know, like, I've I've met, I think I've met almost all of you now, but I can get the gist of everyone's personality yeah. <laughs> just for meeting one or two of you. So, yeah, your, your parents are otherworldly yeah that's <laughs> that's crazy i was talking to the old man the other day and because we have four kids playing ball on four different teams right now in four different towns in central alberta and like we're just down at the mill and i asked him out old man like how the hell did you do it like how is it even freaking possible that you got us where we needed to go and he coached us all the you know up until i was in bantam he coached me and and all the other ones too and we very rarely rode with anybody else i don't mm. i don't know how the hell they did it i can't do it now yeah, you need friends. You need you need those carpools for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, you know, just another example. Just you know, small town central Alberta. Everybody pitches in to get everybody where they needed to go, and got everybody fed, got everybody watered. We only left. I think we left. Mom left Jim behind about four different times in the wrong <laughs> town. But other than that, everybody. Okay, though, right? yeah. Well, kind of. Kind of. He's okay. He had a good run. Yeah. <laughs> Was there ever a time when you were playing with one of your brothers where you had to go protect him on the ice because someone was picking on him? Oh, yeah, Joey all the time because he's a <laughs> pussy. Me and Dan always had to protect him when we played together in Richmond. Like, I think that year, me and I had 460 minutes, and I think Dan had 300. Joe had, like, 25 slashing penalties. But, yeah, he, he wrote a lot of checks that we had to cash for sure all the time, Joey. The rest of them are all – they're pretty handy with the mitts there. He could look after themselves. But Joe always had a stick that was long enough if 
if they got through a stick from them from him trying to spear him in the face then he, he was toast so but we'd he'd buy enough time for us to go and rescue him all the time so so pete i know that you play was it half of you have played for the rebels you jim and ted all played for the rebels right it pretty did was there any overlap ever no jim uh, i think there was one year after i was gone uh, when Jim came in there before Brent bought the team. And then after Jim was done, I think there was one year gap before Ted came in. And yeah, we all played four years here and had a great time. And neither of them were on RDTV though, right? Doing no. the, the Rebels hockey tips? No. No tune crew for those guys. <laughs> Losers. <laughs> I remember when we started the podcast and we found that and it was, I think I'd met you a couple times, but we didn't, didn't that's probably how you found out this podcast even existed, I bet, was when when we shared that. And I remember I, your wife shared it after. So, so yeah, that's a big, that's something no one can ever take away from you. The only Vandermeer to be part of the tune crew. That's right. It was pretty special. They made sure they uh, filmed those after a day off too so we're more than hung to the gills when we're <laughs> trying to skate around teaching kids how to hit and shoot and all that stuff but that's the old lady loves that one so i got flowing locks she throws that in every <laughs> once in a while and puts her blindfold on and away we go <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's a great point to, to kind of go into some more hockey stories because I know you have a whole lot. You're on a lot of hot stoves and stuff that people have you on. Uh, but just kind of, I guess, an easy one. Like, do you have a, a weirdest teammate that you – you don't have to actually call them out, but anyone who you played with that was just, just really weird or just stands out in your mind for whatever reason? I had a lot of – like, I played with a lot of guys. Like, <laughs> a lot of guys. I think we are counting it up the other day, and I think it was – I had – I played on 17 different professional teams and then two roller hockey teams too. Oh, wow. So there was, uh, there was a lot of characters for sure. You know, in the late nineties and two thousands, there was some really, really different cats and, and from all over the world too. Right. Got all the European guys, the French guys, the American guys. And to pick one out of the litter, I think that's we need about eighteen more of those, and for me to figure <laughs> figure out one in particular. Did you uh, did you ever play over over in Europe? No, no, I never did. I, I probably would have got thrown in jail in most of the Lakes for my axe for a deal. But uh, brother Jim played, uh, I think, five years uh, overseas in Switzerland, and then in uh, in Belfast and Northern Ireland in the British League. Um, and brother Joe played a couple years in Germany. But uh, the rest of us were we're Western leaguers. We, we <laughs> don't belong there. Well, on holidays, maybe, but not, not playing hockey. And if you like the the movie, uh, oh, why is it ski? Ice Guardians, right? That's all about enforcers and fighting. And watching that kind of opened my eyes too, and made me realize, in a lot of ways, obviously fighting way down in hockey in general. It's like it's a. I think in most leagues now, it's a you're done for the game, and maybe a suspension too. But do you think that the game is is safer? Or like a little bit more dangerous now without fighting because guys don't have to answer the bell as much for some of the cheap stuff they do. Well, there, there's some of that, but for the most part, like it just drags games on. Like it, just our senior hockey games, right? Like it's one fight and you're out. And so everybody's a tough guy. Everybody chirps and chirps and chirps, right? And it just it prolongs games, and then it does it, it. The fuses build, and everything boils up, and there's no real outlet for that sort of stuff, right? And and the argument's always been there that you know take the fighting out, there's going to be more sticks. And yeah, sticks are up because you're not worried about your repercussions. You're more worried about taking a penalty and, and getting scored on a power play than getting thumped, right? So, you know, that that's an age-old argument for sure. And I, I really think there needs to be some deterrent in there for your actions or your words. Like if a guy wants to call you a, a pussy instead of getting suspended, well, it gets beat up and then it's yeah. over, that's over, right? Yeah. Then it just kind of ends things, I guess. But, you know, it, it just seems like whenever there are Big things, especially over the last five, ten years, any kind of controversy in hockey, then to correct it, the powers that be just go overboard, so crazy, like whatever it is. And, and I get they're trying to get a handle on different things that are that are wrong with the game, but there's so many things that are right with the game that mm -hmm. don't need to go crazy on that sort of stuff. I think, anyways. Speaking about what's right with the game, well, how about those Edmonton Oilers? <laughs> um, do you like their chances? I mean, I don't know when this this is going to air, but the, the right now they they're about to play Dallas. So. Right, they, they, it's zero zero right now. Um, I I think they're I think they're going all the way this year. I hope so. I really do. Like yeah. I said, I grew up in a Weathers fan, but 
we talk about this around the house with the kids and with all my buddies all the time. Like you, you get, it doesn't matter what league you're in, you get out of the first round, you got a chance. Yeah. And, and like, there's so much parity in the NHL right now. Like everybody's good. Everybody had a chance at made playoffs, right? You had teams not making playoffs that have 95 points. Mm-hmm. Everybody's good. These last four teams that are standing, any one of them can win it. And I hope Edmonton does. I just, I think Dallas is solid. Yeah. So Edmonton's going to have to play awesome. The Woods going to have to play awesome. And they're going to have to do everything perfect where Dallas, I think, is a better team. But hopefully Edmonton gets gets rolling and goes through. All right. You, hear, you heard it here first. Pete's predicting the Oilers. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just funny. He's telling you with his hair under your chair. Yeah. <laughs> Sweep it all. Oh, that's only his hair. Right now, <laughs> before, before the recording. Um, Pete, was there a particular playoff run or anything that you had during your career that you look back on fondly as, you know, maybe you went deep and, and won a championship or maybe it was just – a run that you had with with the city and the fans that felt special. Is there anything that you look back on really fondly? Well, yeah, I lost three Calder Cups in the finals there. That kind of sucked. But getting a chance to go on those runs, like uh, that's a championship in the American Hockey League, and, and one that was just fantastic. Uh, Brucey Boudreau was coaching us in, in Hershey, where uh, Washington's farm team in the American Hockey League, and and we finished with the best record in the league. I think we had 130 points or something crazy that year. And we uh, we went on a run, didn't lose a game, and uh, swept three rounds. And we're just cruising and golfing and hanging out and having a great time. And then some asshole named Carrie Price showed up there for <laughs> Hamilton, which I played for Hamilton the year before. And all the guys, all my buddies I played with the year before, and we lost out in the second round. But yeah, Kerry showed up after uh, a great round in Tri-Cities and stood on his head and made it look so easy. Yeah. We lost to him in six games, but we put 60 shots a night on him. Yeah. And I don't think he broke a sweat. It was ridiculous. He was so good. It was, it was fantastic right up until we lost that. That was a hell of a run. And just so much fun. And so much time in between rounds, too, and you sweep. Everybody else is battling <laughs> seven games, and we're golfing and going on trips and hanging out and, you know, doing our work and being ready to go. But, yeah, that was, that was a hell of a run. Do, they, do you think they still do that now, the AHL teams, that, like, during playoff runs, go out and golf on, on the off days or – or is it dependent on the individual? Or the it, individual it, dep- it depends who's coaching what, what yeah. the things are there. Like that was like we did our work, but that, we just had such a good team, and we just walked through everybody. Yeah. And it was it was fun. I was on teams that yeah, you weren't allowed to do anything, no extracurricular ever. And those teams were usually suck. The teams that we had some freedom to act like men instead of like little boys, and then you know we just we spent so much time together, we just bonded so well, and we'd do anything for each other. That's Usually, when the teams are really, really good. Uh, so, Pete, you mentioned you you played for a number of teams in your in your career. Did you did you happen to have a a favorite coach, a least favorite coach? Uh, uh, any stories about about coaches? Yeah, had lots of them, right? Like so many, it's it's hard to tell. Like when everybody asks, even going back to like you know who a guy cheers for and stuff. Now, after being such a suitcase, used to always just cheer for you know, the guys that I played with that were still playing the teams that they were still going on in playoffs. But, but now it's to the point where it's now it's coaches, right? Guys they played with that are, <laughs> that are coaches, right? The yeah. guy gets older and longer in the tooth. You change what you're, who you're hoping for. But like, uh, I'm just saying before there, like Rick Tockett, you know, with Vancouver, he was my assistant coach in Phoenix and Wayne was coaching us there. That was pretty cool to play for Wayne Gretzky. I don't care who you are. It's, yeah. it's yeah. a pretty cool, cool deal. And, I'm meeting him for the first time. Like, hi, Mr. Gretzky. How are you doing? Like, like shut up, Pete. Just call me Wayne. Like, yes, sir, Mr. Gretzky. Yeah. Uh, but that that was cool as heck. And but got a chance. I played for Pete Laviolette. You know, coaching in New York. They're now with a hell of a team. He was such a a good guy. He gave so many of us guys that at the time were I was in the East Coast League and gave me a chance to play in the American League and let me establish myself, which he did with a lot of guys. That he's done that at, at that level and then again at the NHL level. And, Really cool to play for guys like that. Uh, Bruce Boudreaux that I played for in Hershey. Just great guys, great communicators. Uh, Jared Bednar, too, was coaching. In, wow. I played with him in Rochester, and then he was my assistant coach in uh, with Calgary in, in Abbotsford in the American League. Like it, It's it's so cool. Like The hockey world is so small, especially mm-hmm. the older you, or the longer you play and the older you get. Like It just shrinks and shrinks, and it's amazing how the good guys keep going on. And guys that aren't so good kind of get weeded out over time. Sometimes it takes a while, but it, <laughs> it, it's it's amazing how many great guys are in the game and, and the guys that stick around for a long time 
Uh, another guy, Craig Berube, I, I played on a line with, oh, wow. yeah. with Chief. Me and him and PJ Stock played on a line together in, in Philadelphia for, for a couple of years. That was that was fun. <laughs> yeah, that. Uh, and now now I got to I, – I might have to – no, I'm not going to cheer for the Leafs, but I hope he does good because I can't stand the Leafs. Sorry. So the coaches do well there always. Oh, well, they make money. Place to they coach, make money, yeah. and then they're gone, and then they can hang out on the golf course and still make money. Well, and then they get hired immediately again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Keith just got picked up again, eh? So yeah, that's that's tough. That market is crazy. Oh, like between that and and Montreal as well. Like I I play a little bit in Montreal, their farm team in Hamilton, and the media there, and the uh, the scrutiny on every single thing you do, good or bad, is. That's a tough deal. Like, I feel bad for those guys in Toronto. Still well, don't like them, but I feel bad for them. So how's your uh, how's your French? I can parlay a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I, right. I understand everything. I actually have advanced French from Caroline High, so I'm right topped up. Oh, wow. I can, I can understand everything. I just can't speak it worth a crap. Yeah. It's terrible. But I, I know when the Frenchies are swearing at me. I, I know what's going well, on. Well, you won't be able to coach in Montreal then. <laughs> no, that's right. You're out. Can't. That's fine. So were you, I can imagine uh, for home teams, you're probably a bit of a, a fan favorite, but were you, were you a big target in, in visiting rinks a lot? Like, do you have maybe one, cause I know fans are wild, right? Who is, I don't think it was your, your brother, Ted, but someone got a beer dumped on him once in medicine hat in the old rink. Like, do you have anything like just the most hostile away environment you've ever been a part of? Yeah, I got a good one just popped into my head there. Um, like the fans in the Southeastern States, right? they, knew nothing about hockey, right? They <laughs> loved the the boards crashing and they loved goals and they loved the fights, right? And they really didn't know what was going on. They have to announce, you know, whatever <laughs> why the whistle was all the time, right? And they still do like in Carolina and stuff to do that as well. But I heard they did that in Vegas when yeah, the, the first came. year. Yeah, first year yeah, too. Absolutely. Because they, they don't know and fine, fair enough. But uh, I was playing in the East Coast League and uh I don't know if it was it was. It was Aaron Downey and, and Sean Thornton, who are pretty much the same person, right? And I, I, pl <laughs> I, I played with Downs and Prov, and just one of the best human beings ever, a great teammate. But him and Sean Thornton are, are the same type of guy. And it, it was Thorny. It was Sean. I was playing in Richmond. They were playing in Hampton Roads, like at Norfolk, Virginia. It's, you know, a close geographical rival a couple hours down the road. And they loved the fights there, right? Anyways, I fought all the time. Their crowd hated me. Our crowd hated their guys, hated Sean. And we got in a fight down in, in Norfolk and we were rolling around in a ball and, and the ref actually stepped on Sean's hand cool. and cut his hand. And he gets up and he's yelling. He was a, a master at playing the refs too. And he bit me, he bit me, right? <laughs> like, oh my God. Thorny, you asshole. You know I didn't bite you. And the ref, like, the refs are on the same circuit as us. We're with them all. Like, I didn't bite him. Like, yeah. line, he stepped on him. Like, yeah, no problem. But this goes to the media and the fans, right? We come back down there two weeks later, there's 5,000 signs, bite me Vandermeer. Oh, and everybody's screaming, bite me Vandermeer. I've got three of them in my, I got a little <laughs> folder, just kept them with some blood sprinkled on them. Oh, it was funny stuff. But yeah. Who was it that actually did that once? It was a, it there's was a, been a few. Thing, right? Burroughs? Was it Burroughs? Yeah, Burroughs. Burroughs is maybe, a biter. Yeah, Burroughs is one. And maybe, maybe Yarko Rutu. I'm thinking of did he ever apologies Yarko Rutu if you watch this podcast <laughs> defamation fight anyone but but yeah yeah it, there's obviously a lot of that, like a lot of that stuff have you seen any actual biting oh, or yeah. anything like that it yeah for happen. sure well even like going back to junior like you roll around in balls on the ice you know we had so many line brawls and stuff where the, the linesmen the refs couldn't get to you and whatnot it's, you're rolling around and somebody be you, if you weren't fish hooking or eye gouging, they were doing it to you, right? So somebody's got their hand halfway down your throat, you're gonna bite it. So we <laughs> we grew up doing that. Like you don't go and bite somebody on purpose, but if your hand is in your mouth, well, you're gonna bite it and slobber all over it. That's true. Yeah, if someone sticks their finger in my mouth, I'm I'm biting them. Yeah. Well, what it depends. I mean, it depends on the situation in hockey. <laughs> context, yeah. right? That's first true. date. Context. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see, right? yeah that's more. Context. That's yeah. more of a fourth date. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Like, oh. come on, I'm a traditionalist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that is that the worst thing too? Like, I always see you know that the hand wash, the kind of the hand in the face and stuff. I have to imagine that's like the worst thing you can do to a guy is just your like smelly like botulism that i guess wouldn't be botulism but just the bacteria on the gloves and stuff too that's gross gloves stink right but a, a good thumb in the eye works out pretty good because it doesn't look like it's that bad or 
or the duck bill. You just take your blade and just slide it in somebody's mouth. That's a, <laughs> that's okay. Just over the course of conversation, you don't you get pisses you off when somebody's rubbing your nose, but a thumb in the eye or a stick down the. I don't think you're really mouth. thinking about germs when someone's giving no. you a face, a face wash. It's just- yeah, but you're you're used to the smell though. Like it's That's true, yeah. like every everyone's hockey equipment smells the same for the most part. And I'm sure there's the odd guy out there where it just smells pretty pretty different because he's doing some weird shit. But but pro junior guys, we we always have three four sets of gloves too, so they're not like your regular. That's true. They're not like beer league. Gloves. No, they're not sitting <laughs> yeah. in the basement for three weeks <laughs> yeah. and stanking up, right? Shed, yeah, yeah no. exactly. They're on the dryers all the time. They're not, they're they're quite clean. Uh, Pete, you mentioned you played uh, in in Phoenix or Arizona. What are your what are your thoughts on the the team moving to uh, Utah? Well, I actually played in Utah too, which is a great town. Like a great town. I played a, uh, for the Grizzlies in the East Coast League and played out of the, the the rink they had for the Olympics, which is in the West Valley, which is a ways away, but downtown out of, out of that new building where the Jazz play. It'll be great. It's a great town, like fantastic. The whole lead up and moving in the last 10 years Ugh. of the saga in Arizona oh is yeah. beyond a joke. It, it's, it's terrible. And why – like the NHL and Gary and whoever you want to blame keeping that team there, that when they do finally build a rink in the right part of town, it mm-hmm. will be a model franchise. Right. But yeah. just having the rink on the other side of town and before that playing out of the, the basketball rink downtown mm-hmm. where you could, if you sat, you had to sit in the second deck, you couldn't see the right. net below you. Just the angles are built for basketball. It, it's just not right. Everybody that goes to a game comes from Scottsdale or Mesa or Gilbert. They're not, they're on the other side of the valley, right? And there's over 4 million people. There's more people live in the valley of the sun than live in Alberta. Like, yeah. And half of them are Alberta. So <laughs> once they build, That's very true. Once yeah. they build a team, build a rink on the right side of town, it'll be great. But the whole debacle of the last 10 years is it's gross. It sucks. I, I'm, I'm part of the Coyote alumni and I go down there every winter and, and, and spend a bunch of time and golf with the guys and do a bunch of charity stuff down there oh, with those shocking. guys. Shocking. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's weird. It's fun. Hang out. There's a couple of the guys that run the uh, Wayne McBean and, and Gus Adams that run the alumni association. Um, Wayne owns a golf course down there. So it's, it's pretty cool to go down yeah. and hang out and do that sort of stuff. But once they get the rink situation figured out, it'd be great. If this owner doesn't, it, it'll, it'll be too bad. So I've never been to, uh, to Utah or uh, I guess Salt Lake before. I, I've been to the airport, but not <laughs> not the the city. Like, what's the where's the place to go? What's where's your favorite place in uh... everywhere? Everybody thinks it's a joke because it's Mormons, right? Right. A great nightlife, great food, great culture, everything. It's great. It's not a bunch of like everybody's sitting at home, Mormonville, right? Like, it, it's nothing wrong with Mormons either. It's just, <laughs> it's it's a great town. You can. Park City is just up the hill, like not even an hour away. You can do all the skiing. It's just like Whistler there. And then we did it twice. We got, we skied in the morning and golfed in the afternoon. Like, it's beautiful. Like, I mean, the area is pretty amazing. Sick. Like, so, is really, it, are there any, like, uh, uh, dry dry areas? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, but not the whole city, though, right? No. no, it's like like any big city. There'll be a, okay, now you're in Murray, Utah. And across the road, you're in Sandy, Utah. In Murray, you can't buy beer at the gas station. In Sandy, you can't. Like, it's, okay. Okay. you know, just the different little jurisdictions are dry and different places in the state are, like different counties. But Salt Lake itself, it, it's huge. Like, it's a uh, amalgamation of, I think, 50 different cities there. And it's like 100 miles long. There is so much stuff to do there. My, my dad drives down to uh, Palm Springs every year and he just bitches every time he goes through Salt Lake because <laughs> the, the traffic there is just nuts. Yeah, it's the worst. They've been working on roads since the olympics in 2000 and they're not done yet so it, it, so it it's a bugger now, yeah. yeah it's a bugger driving through i'm the same way when we we usually drive down to arizona every year and i plan my whole trip on when we're going through salt lake because wow, it is okay. forever to get through it yeah. yeah so so do you think like a team will do pretty well there though i mean it seems like the fan base is already there it's not right it's what about three hundred thousand people like in salt lake and about a million yeah, there's more than that in so. in the metro area. There's there's probably closer to two million people, and yeah, like having the basketball owner integrating everything right in, they they'll do fine. They've got a built in fan base, and they're he's using all his technical wizardry to get everybody hot and horny about it. And I think they'll do they'll do good, and and hopefully the the team does good. Another old teammate of mine, Bill Armstrong's GM there, too. He'll 
he's been doing a good job with with Arizona with how he's been hand, being handcuffed with the mm-hmm. whole yeah. situation anyways but their team that throughout most of the year they're in a playoff spot too like they're close and hopefully having a little bit more money and stability will we'll get them over the hump and get a couple of good picks and and if they win oh they'll yeah. be fine so you're I think what Pete's saying is lay some money on Utah to win the Stanley Cup next year Maybe the year after. Yeah, about, okay, too. Give them a year, they need they need to learn how to lose in the playoffs. <laughs> right, that's right. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, they got to yeah. go through it. Odds are probably pretty nice. Yeah, plus seven thousand or something. <laughs> Put five bucks on. It. Never know what's going to happen. Might, yeah. Um. So you played a couple games in the NHL, as you mentioned for Wayne Gretzky, which is pretty cool. Um. And I think that was later on in your career, right? Yeah. So how how did the guys in the room receive that? Like how how was it? You know going through that journey of playing pro and playing for a million different teams over the years and then finally getting your shot. Yeah. It's uh, it's surreal is not the right, like I was 32 years old. I'm one of the oldest guys ever played his first, you know, regular season game. And yeah, you think for so many years, like I played in every league there is and all these teams that don't even exist leagues that don't even exist anymore. But uh, you know, I always, that was my goal. That's what I, dreamed about doing and I did everything I could to get there and when it finally finally happened I I got the call and I told the boys this on spitting chiclets too like we were on the road in Hamilton and I got I got called in by a coach and said hey you're not playing tonight I'm like what the fuck do you mean I'm not playing tonight I'm, I used to play here I'm playing so no we got great news for you he got called up I'm like no that's not funny it's that's quit pissing around it's not a joke he says no we're dead serious like I need the paperwork Get me the paperwork, go upstairs, <laughs> get the facts, the rolly up facts, get me the facts and show me. Otherwise, I'm beating the shit out of you two right now. <laughs> coach Greg Ireland is their head coach. Ray Edwards, great guy. He was assistant in Calgary for a while before I, I played with him, with Ray before, a good buddy. He said, no, Pistol, we're serious. Like, you're going up. And so then I had to fly across country and had like three, four days to think about it. <laughs> Just rattled totally. And then when I got there, uh, the guys just treated me like I'd been there forever, right? Like, you know, I was a veteran guy, older guy. Everybody likes the tough guys because they look after you, right? So, yeah. but like I played against Shane Doan, we're kind of the same age. Like he played in, in Camus, beat the absolute crap out of us in Red Deer over and over again in those years. Um, but welcome me in like I'd been there for 10 years. Derek Morris, good buddy of ours from Sylvan Lake was there. Like, Pistol, you're staying with me. You're not staying in a hotel. Like that kind of stuff. They just made it awesome. And, and Gretzky was the head coach, talk was assistant, Grant Fuhrer, like guys that I've looked up to my whole life or, yeah, fuck, you've been here forever. Where you go, you know what to do. Just go do your job. And it was, it was amazing. So did you, did you notice like a, a, a giant jump in the play from, from the HL to the NHL? Like it's easier. It's way easier. And every level up from the lowest Going up, every step up the ladder, it's easier to play. As long as you can keep up, like mm-hmm. your skills are there, it's just easier. It's less scrambly. It's like going from midget AAA to junior A, same as going junior A to the Western League. Western League to the East Coast, the American League. Every step up the ladder is just easier to play. Everybody is more skilled. More where they're supposed to be, more skilled, can handle shittier passes, can give better ones. Um, and it's just it's just more structured, right? And as long as you can keep up and your you know your role or your job within the structure, it's easy. It's just easy and it's just so fun. And then it's like, I want to do this forever. This is fantastic. Ah, no kid, beat it. Get out of here. <laughs> Had shit. your shot. See you later. But thanks for coming. And it, it was such an amazing experience. And just like anybody, if you fulfill your life dream, it doesn't get much better than that. And just wish more people could experience that kind of like seriously joy. I guess, I guess eventually, especially with our technical difficulties tonight, we've had you here forever, so we'll start to, to wrap up. But a couple more uh, just quick hockey stories, I guess. And one, if you can pick one or just not even the most memorable fight you've ever had, but one that really stands out in your head, whether it was the outcome or just who you fought or, or anything like that, or even the, the toughest guy you've ever fought. Well, I was lucky or unlucky enough to come up in an era when everybody was getting super weapons right there yeah everybody was you know a big guy used to be six four and everybody all of a sudden was six eight and 300 pounds and jacked and <laughs> half the guys were on juice and half guys weren't and there are a lot of tough guys that came through the american league and all did the same job in the nhl as big men guys brian mcgratton and you know big stevie mcintyre good buddy of mine right as i like it, it, all these big guys but um 
a year I was playing in um, in Grand Rapids, the year of the lockout in 04, uh, Detroit's farm team. Um, Minnesota had Derek Bugard and, and a couple other guys there. And I fought Boogie about five times that year. <laughs> and wow. thank God he didn't have everything figured out then. He was still a kid figuring it out because, you know, the next year he's knocking guys mm-hmm. heads off and ending guys' careers. Um, but I fought him one night and I fought John Scott in the second night too, like back to back, those two guys. You fought an NHL all-star? I NHL did fight an all-star MVP. And yeah. yes. And yeah. good for him. What a great story oh, yeah. that is. Like that is awesome. Gary trying to screw him out of that, traded him out town yeah. and everything else. And like they set up the rules. Wasn't yeah. his yeah. fault. He I got in that. there and then pulled it off. Great. And that's, I'm so happy and good for him. Like, I don't know, John, like we fought a bunch of times and same thing got him when he didn't have everything figured out because then he was knocking everybody out like it was his job in the nhl too but being able to survive guys like that and not not get put to sleep or get embarrassed by guys like that mm-hmm. it, it looks like you, you you can't lose right you win right. You, whether you're on the road or if you're at home like oh my god you're a superhero if you're on the road then everybody starts writing signs about what a puke you are but <laughs> that's all fun like being able to do that job for that long and not have too many bad injuries like teeth all knocked out and stuff like that par for the course but to come out of fighting hundreds and hundreds of times and getting to experience all that stuff over the course of you know parts of two decades there was a lot of fun come home and tell stories and get to golf for free and bullshit with guys like you (laughs) what do you mean guys like us is that you know what don't pull at that thread we'll take it as a compliment yeah i think you meant like golfers beauties 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 oh yeah even better yeah, uh, and I guess the last thing too, because you talk about the guys that you fought that you knew really well too, is it because it's I guess our perception of it, maybe we just want to see it that way. It almost seems like the the tough guys, the enforcers in the NHL, almost like off the ice are almost inherently the the nicest guys, right? And like, is there like a little like a tough guys guild, like just that unspoken bond? Too obviously, there's some guys you probably just hate to play against, but it, it does seem like in knowing you and meeting some other guys who were the the enforcers, you're all just like the nicest people I've ever met. Well, because we get to vent all of our evil out. That's why <laughs> yeah. there's none left. We don't have anything to sit and stew on. But, but guys that do that job for any length of time, whether it's in junior and especially pro, like it's over years and years and years, you don't do that stuff for your own well being. Like, yeah, everybody's got an ego and likes you know, people thinking what they do is cool, but you don't lay your body on the line over and over for everybody else. If you're an asshole, like you, mm-hmm. get, you have to have some, you know, paternal instincts and want to look after people. And, you know, that's got to be part of your makeup. Otherwise you don't do it. Guys can do it for a year or two, but in order to do it for any length of time, you have to, you have to have something good in your heart. Cause you're looking after people and that's usually the guys you scrap with. <laughs> well, that's our time. <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> But you, usually, guys you have you fight with for any like time. That's the guy you go and sit and have a beer with that guy on the other team because he's the only one that really knows what the hell you're going through every day, and you you can bullshit about what's going on in your day and how you match up against this guy or that guy. But but mostly it's just about life. So most most of the tough guys I know are pretty good guys. Not including myself in that, I'm kind of a dick. But most guys are <laughs> they're they're great guys to be around, and, and they're always willing to buy a beer and share a story. So guys are like hanging out with my last question for you is uh not hockey related but what do you what do you got planned for the summer any any besides golf because obviously we know you're gonna play in lots of lots of charity tournaments yeah. and whatnot but uh coaching coaching ball coaching hockey uh going traveling just relaxing what watching ball lots of watching ball we got four kids on four different teams throughout central alberta Lots of watching ball, lots of touring around, checking that out. I'm, I'm helping the one, the the boys team in, in Innisfail, the U18s. Just, I don't really have to do much. I can just tell everybody what a good job they're doing and then yeah. let, let the head coach yell and scream at them, tell them what they're doing wrong. But for the most part, we're doing that. We'll, we'll wind up taking a couple trips out to BC to go see some friends out there and watch more ball and get some more golf in. But for, for the most part, we're pretty busy. I have a little firewood company. We're busy with that throughout most of the summer. And then we do our getaways in the wintertime when it's, crappy here we like to escape to arizona and get some more golf in drink some beer down there what's the uh what's the firewood company called i might need i might need some logs yeah it's just vandermeer ventures we're at uh, albertafirewood.ca 
that's our uh, website there with all the prices and everything that's on there, what we offer and good fresh wood out of the, just west of Caroline and we bring her all into town. So Perfect. that's what keeps the wheels going around. Yeah, and you, you can support local too. And yeah, like it's, you draw and you do like drop it right off too. You right? betcha yeah. delivery. Absolutely. All throughout central Alberta. Well, then I guess Pete, cause we've been here a little bit longer than, than we probably should have had you. So we'll, we'll start to wrap up, but thank you again so much for taking the time to do this. I know we've been talking now you know, off and on for a couple of years about getting you on the podcast and you are a guy, and I don't want to put this out there, but I feel like if someone asks something of you and you know, the answer is usually yes. So we really appreciate it. Uh, we meant it, or at least I meant it. I don't know about these two. And I said, you are one of my favorite people. So we're uh, very happy to have you here. Appreciate too. And, uh, and, interview that we figured would be a lot of hockey stories funny stories too uh very insightful too and so thanks for being uh, open and honest and yeah we'll obviously uh, see you out on the golf course no oh, my pleasure ted thank you very much appreciate it thanks guys yeah cheers pete thank you all right so that is it for another installment of barbershop talk a huge thank you one more time to pete vandermeer uh, for being our guest and to red stag barbershop for having us uh, as always, uh, like and subscribe, even if you, you don't like us, uh, just do us a favor and uh, we'll see you next time on Barbershop Talk. Oh dear.